Hello? Are we shouting? Maybe. Mm -hmm. Hello? Hey guys! Hi guys. We'll make yeah. a start now. Sorry yeah. for being Sorry. late. Yeah. We're a bit <laughs> trappy. Anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah. We'll start off with renal anatomy. Have you guys finished renal this week? I think so. Okay. I'll take Calvin's word for it. All right. All right. Okay. All right. So we'll start off with some anatomy. Renal anatomy is pretty like. Sorry. Renal anatomy is pretty low, not low yield, but like there's not going to be as many questions on renal anatomy as there are um, in like other exams. Anatomy is not as big a chunk. or well, renal's not anyway. Um, so embryology, you have like basically your kidneys form from like intermediate mesoderm. You remember back all the way to like all the different types. But you start off with pronephros. You can see that at the top there, um, which is, forms in week four, and it can't actually do anything. It's just the structure there. So there's no excretory capacity. Um, and then you get your mesonephros, which is your kind of your transient kidney for about the first trimester. And it contributes to your male genital der uh, derivatives, which is sometimes a question that comes up, um, like which part of like the embryological kidney contributes to male genital derivatives. And this contributes to like the, like the testes, the ductules, like the ductus deferens, which you'll learn more about next time. But yeah, it also contributes to certain female genital derivatives, but the function of those isn't like completely known. They're kind of just there. No one knows what they do. So, yep. Then you got your metanephros, which is your formed in week five. It's your permanent kidney. It's very important to know that after 36 weeks of gestation, no more new nephrons are formed. So if you've got like a low number of nephrons at 36 weeks, that's the number you're going to have for the rest of your life. And probably like that's going to decrease as you get older. Um, and then at day 32, you get branching. Also like red on the slides is kind of buzzwordy know it for the exams. So your ureteric bud forms your ureter, your pelvis, your calyces and collecting ducts. And then your metanephric mesenchyme forms your nephron. So actually the glomerulus, the tubules and the interstitium. Um, also a good thing to know for exams. Um, and they induce each other to kind of like form. So like the ureteric bud will send a signal to the metanephric mesenchyme, which will send a signal back. Um, week 10 is urine production and the ureter ureteropelvic junction is the last to analyze and it's the most common site of hydronephrosis in a fetus. Like, yep. So the points where they kind of like, they've induced each other heaps and heaps and they've stopped now. So, yep. Uh, this is pretty low yield. Don't, I mean, you could learn it, but just in there for your information. Um, you can also get a horseshoe kidney. Now you would have had a lecture on like kakut. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is one of the bigger conditions, like something more clinically relevant. So your kidneys form, but their inferior poles are fused. And as they try to migrate up in the abdomen, the inferior mesenteric artery stops them from moving up. Um, they function pretty normally. There are a couple of people that have horseshoe kidneys. Okay. Question. You can put your hand up or we'll pick you randomly. <laughs> and don't look at the next slide if you've got the slides. <laughs> All right. Anyone? Ella Ryan. <laughs> you have to. Go on. Just pick one. There you go. <laughs> um, so the important thing to note more, you need to just know that your, your pronephros or the pronephroi, 
is like <laughs> the first one has no like kidney capabilities like you can't excrete urine or anything and the rest of the stuff is just extra information that's true um so you've got your two kidneys your left kidney is from p12 to l1 and it's high and lies at the transpyloric plane i'm assuming you've covered a lot of the transpyloric plane in gi know that just as an additional like fact your right kidney is lower does anyone know why your right kidney is lower than your left kidney yeah so your liver pushes the right kidney down um they're both retroperitoneal structures and just another like good fact to know is that your left renal vein is longer than your right renal vein and it, as you can see on the diagram can you yep, see how it like travels underneath the sma so if your SMA compresses it, like you're going to have, it's called nutcracker syndrome, which we'll go over that later. Um, and your right renal artery passes posterior to your IVC. Innovation's not that important, but it's on the slides for you to have a look at if you want to. All right, I don't know why that looks like that. But so your terms of your blood supply for your kidney, your renal arteries come straight off your aorta, I think just before the IMA, yep. And your ureteric arteries, so the ones that supply your ureters, come off the renal artery. Uh, good to know the post, like the progression of the arteries, so from renal to segmental. Uh, good to know how many segmental arteries there are. <laughs> <laughs> and like then you get, obviously, you've got all your arteries in the diagram. You get down to your efferent arterial, and then your peritubular capillaries in your Vasorecta, vasorecta, supply your tubules. Um, and it depends which region of the nephron you're in on what they're called because they have a few differences. All right, that's just another diagram. Show like what it looks like. Then you've got your ureters, which are muscular tubes. They have peristaltic motions. They in like the reason they can have like they're called vermiculations. The reason that they can perform these movements is they've got their inner layer is longitudinal muscle and their outer is spiral muscle. They're 25 centimetres in length and they've got, they're lined with transitional epithelium. You do need to know they're lined with a special type of epithelium. This epithelium can like change its shape, which we'll go over that later anyway. Um, they travel laterally to medially. So in abdominal surgery, when the surgeon looks at the abdomen, they're the only structure that travels laterally to medially. And if you want to identify it, you like flick it and it does its little peristaltic motion. Anyway, <laughs> the ureter passes under the, ure uh, the uterine artery. You remember that as like water under the bridge. And like your ureter is inserted into your bladder at an acute angle. So that like you're, when like once urine collects in your bladder, you're not going to get it rushing back up into the ureters again and then into your kidneys. Yeah. This is also important to know. Am I going too fast? Should I slow down? No, okay. Speed up? No. Okay. <laughs> You've got your ureteric constrictions. You should know this. This is the most common places your renal stones are going to lodge. So you've got the pelvo-ureteric junction, so where your ureter kind of goes into your kidney. You've got the pelvic brim, so that's kind of where the common iliac artery bifurcates. Um, and the vesico-ureteral vesico junction, which is where the ureters enter the bladder, which is also known as the vesicle. And that's the narrowest kind of place. Um, and then in terms of kidney structure, your nephron is one functional unit. And then you've got your tubular system. So you've got your proximal convoluted tubule, which does the bulk of your reabsorption. And Kalathi will talk about that, but like pretty much everything gets reabsorbed there. Um, your loop of Henle concentrates your urine um, and your distal collecting, is it D? I forgot what it stands for. Um, that's just regulating it finely under hormonal control. So that's really fine tuning it. But most of your stuff that you need to bring back into the body from whatever's been filtered into the kidneys happens in the proximal convoluted tubule. No. <laughs> uh, you've got your renal cortex and your medulla. Your cortex receives most of the blood because that's where most of the filtration happens. And then your renal medulla is where you get the urinary concentration. So it receives less blood. It's just another diagram. 
Um, your hilum is where the ureter vessels and nerve and nerves enter. Um, it's important to know the order. So anterior, your vein, your renal vein is the most anterior and then it goes your artery and then it's your pelvis as in like your ureter. So vein, artery, ureter. And then you've got your renal corpuscle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's made up of your glomerulus. So that's like your endothelial cells, your mesangial cells, which fun fact, they can contract to increase and decrease surface area, uh, your podocytes, your Bowman's capsule, your glomerular filtration barrier, which is your finished, like, yeah, it's up there. All right, and then histo. Histo's pretty, like, I don't think there were that, that was that much emphasis placed on histo, but again, know this, all nephrons are formed by 36 weeks. If you do have low nephron numbers, that predisposes you to hypertension and renal failure. Um, your uriniferous tubule is your nephron and collecting duct, and your collecting duct is not actually a part of the nephron. So that's also something good to know. Transitional epithelium. This is important. So basically when, you're, uh, when your ureters are relaxed, they're not really filled with anything, they are pseudostratified columnar slash cuboidal. In our histo -tute, they said columnar, but on the internet it says they can be cuboidal, and that's just because, like, the cells at the base are a little bit of a different shape to the cells towards the apical area. But basically it goes from columnar cuboidal to stratified squamous when it's distended and filling with urine. So that's something special. That's why it's like called transitional epithelium because it transitions in shape. You should know how to label this. Um, has come up in like Moodle quizzes and other stuff. So, yep. Your glomerular filtration barrier is, so basically that's the thing that stops a lot of other substances getting into the kidneys. So you've got the fenestrated endothelium that's on your blood vessels. So it's just leaky holes that let certain things through. Then you've got your glomerular, glomerular basement membrane, which is made up of like proteoglycans and like glycogen and stuff. But the main point is that it's negatively charged and it repels large negative proteins. So if proteins like albumin try to get in to your kidney to be filtered, they usually can't if you have a healthy kidney with an intact membrane because like it repels those things. And then you've got your foot processes and slit diaphragm as part of your protocyte. Um, what gets filtered from your blood into your kidney is almost identical to the plasma concentration of a lot of substances but the only thing is it's free of protein because protein can't get in. Um, and protocytes are incapable of mitosis. So just something else to know. So there's a lot of histological differences between the proximal and distal, but the distal is larger, it's got a thinner epithelium and there's no brush border. So that like, as we said before, the proximal tubule absorbs the bulk of everything so you want it to have like high surface area for bulk reabsorption but the distal is very like fine-tuned and you don't need that much surface area as you do in the proximal tubule all right renal fizz does anyone have any questions about anatomy okay cool that's still me <coughs> um first year content you've got your body fluid compartments so your intracellular compartment is 60 percent of your total body water um, and your extracellular fluid compartment is 40 percent um, and the ecf composition is pretty much identical to the intracellular composition except for its protein content so again proteins aren't as readily able to get into different places as cations and anions are you could learn this table, but I think the main thing to know is that you've got, you can say hiking, but like high K in, you've got a lot of potassium inside your cells and therefore high sodium extracellularly. And there's a diagram there. It's also high protein inside your cells, but not in the actual interstitium. Um, yep. Do you like to add anything to that? Uh, and then you've also got a special, uh, specialized fluid compartment in your body that's called, like it's got transcellular fluid in it. This is 
different and it's separated from the rest of the body. You don't need to know too much about it or, or know about it, but it was in the lecture. So it's separated from the rest of the body and its ionic comp composition is different. Then you've got your fluid exchange. So if you've got two body compartments, water moves pretty freely between them. Um, the movement or the bulk of the movement of water is determined by two forces. So hydrostatic pressure is how fast the blood flows and osmotic pressure is the tendency of solvent molecules to move in the direction of lower solvent activity. But basically hydrostatic pressure is like if you think about a tube and water rushing through that tube, the faster the water rushes through that tube and if that tube had holes in it, the more likely it is to extract extra out of that tube. Um, and if it was going slower, less likely to go out the little holes. Um, and in terms of osmotic pressure, um, you've got certain substances that like attract water. So if you had a lot of sodium, you know, like in your cells, uh, water rushes in to try and like even that out. That's kind of the same osmotic pressure as like if you've got big proteins, they're going to draw water towards them. Um, so you can see there like in the capillary lumen and interst interstitial space, Obviously, in capillaries, you're going to have a high hydrostatic pressure because that's where the blood is flowing through. And osmotic pr pressure depends on um, how much albumin and protein is in there. All right, uh, renal blood flow. So a lot of your cardiac output actually goes to your kidneys. You filter your entire plasma volume. So all the plasma in your body that gets filtered 60 times a day, which is a lot. Um, and 99% of the filtrate is returned to the body. It's important to know the filtration fraction, which is GFR over renal plasma flow, and it's about 20%. Uh, you do need to know that it's renal plasma flow. Like, you need to know this equation because sometimes um, you can get tricked, I guess, in assessments about it being renal plasma flow or renal blood flow. Um, and like in terms of things that are easily filtered by the kidney, you've got like sodium, potassium, amino acids, urea, glucose, water, and some small proteins, but not filtered easily are like large proteins like albumin, red blood cells in a normal kidney should not be passing through the glomerular filtration barrier, um, and platelets. And that's just for anyone who wants to see how all the equations are worked out, or you could just know them. Um, in terms of functions of the kidney, these are the functions. So it regulates your water and your electrolytes. Acid base, important. Metabolic waste products, like it removes those, removes toxins. It secretes hormones. So it secretes uh, erythropoietin, mm. which helps make red blood cells, um, active vitamin D and renin, which is involved in like the greater scheme of things. <laughs> well, I think we'll talk about that later. And it also does gluconeogenesis. And I think the lecturer said to us last year that the kidney does more than the liver, but I don't know how accurate she was. So. All right. Renal clearance. This is important. They like to, they do like to ask about, like, you know, they'll give you an equation. They'll give you values and they'll expect you to work out clearance of a substance. Um, so it's the volume of plasma completely cleared of a substance per unit time, and we use it to estimate the GFR. So that's the glomerular filtration rate. Um, so creatinine is the one that's most widely used, but you do need to know because it's an endogenous substance, so your muscle, it's a product of muscle breakdown, it's actually secreted as well. So when the kidneys like filter it through and then it gets reabsorbed into the blood, no, no. Yes, sorry. So it's traveling through your bloodstream as a breakdown product and sometimes your bloodstream can excrete it into the tubule. Yes. Um, so very complicated, but just know that a small amount of it is secreted so it's not 100% um, accurate. 60%, oh, it's 50 to 60% loss of renal function needs to occur before we can see differences in plasma creatinine. Um, and there's also a creatinine clearance equation which accounts for a person's age, weight, and gender. But it's important to know this equation. So it's basically the urine concentration, if some, like you measure how much in the urine, what the concentration of a certain substance is, uh, as, and then times it by the urine flow rate, so how much urine you're actually excreting, times by, oh, divided by how much of that substance is actually in your plasma. So you wanna see how much is being um, 
filtered out of the kidneys and excreted. It's just a bit of a diagram. So some substances are fully like uh, absorbed, so they all go back into the circulation. Some substances you get extra secretion like creatinine um, and some substances just aren't even like absorbed by the kidney. Uh, inulin is your gold standard for measuring GFR, but it's very inconvenient to use. So uh, you need to IV infuse it at a constant rate. You need to like measure the urine at a constant, like at, at certain times with a constant flow rate, which as you can imagine would be hard to do on the ward, like in a hospital. So we use creatinine. Um, if something has a clearance rate more than the glomerular filtration rate, you pretty much assume it's being secreted. If it's got some like a value less than the glomerular filtration rate, it's being reabsorbed. So some of it has been reabsorbed by the body. Is there any questions? Oh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Tell me your answer and explain why it's that answer. Chris Rose. <laughs> Yes, why? <laughs> yep, good job. Um, clearance of which substance can be used to estimate renal plasma flow? You in the purple sweater down the front. <laughs> hey, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so renal plasma flow is measured by the clearance of PAH. Uh, it underestimates a little bit, a little bit, but you use once you get the value of renal plasma flow, you can calculate renal blood flow. Again, no, you use PAH to measure that don't really need to know the equation because we like if you go back to the one with all the equations, you can see that they use this equation to work out like how to measure renal blood flow in GFR. All right, and also kidneys only filter the plasma and not the blood. All right. Renal filtration and clearance. So whatever that come whatever comes out in the urine is a result of what's been filtered into the glomerulus, what's been secreted and what's been reabsorbed, all right? Um, so filtration is movement from, yep, it's, I just said that. So secretion is, it's important to get the difference between secretion and reabsorption. Secretion is removing it from the body and reabsorption is taking it back in. So GFR, net filtration pressure times the glomerular filtration coefficient don't need to worry about KF as much, but your net filtration pressure, as if you remember before, we talked about osmotic and hydrostatic pressures and the balance between them. So your net filtration pressure is a result of that. So it's your hydrostatic pressure in your glomerular capillaries, right? Minus, oh, so the, yes, don't worry. Oh, Bowman space, the hydrostatic pressure in Bowman space. Should have had a key. Um, and the, minus the osmotic pressure in your glomerular capillary. Now, you also have osmotic pressure in Bowman's space, but it's pretty much negligible, so we don't count it in the equation. All right. Is anyone got any questions? Yes. Oh, it's like single nephron GFR, right? And then total GFR is a sum, but we don't usually calculate it singularly. Yep. Let's go back there. <laughs> So the GFR needs to be kept relatively constant because if you make a small change to it, you're going to have a big change to the volume of filtrate that you're processing. So, for example, if you increase your GFR, stuff is going to be moving through the kidney system quite quickly, so it's not going to be able to be reabsorbed back into the body as efficiently, and you lose substances that you would want to keep, like glucose, uh, in the urine. Um, 
in terms of decreased GFR, you get increased reabsorption, but then because it's moving so slowly, you might have like waste products not being excreted. Does that make sense? Sweet. So changing GFR, like if you remember the equation before, you've got KF. Basically, the primary means of changing your GFR is the hydrostatic pressure in your capillaries. Um, if that increases, your GFR increases and vice versa. Um, yep, all good. Sweet. All right, this is important to know because like certain drugs act on both the efferent and afferent arterioles and it's just important to know because of like renal artery stenosis. But if you increase your blood pressure, you're increasing your glomerular, glomerular capillary hydrostatic pressure and that's going to increase your GFR. Yep, because it increases the amount of blood that flows to your kidneys. So your renal, IBF is renal blood flow. Um, you decrease it, you're gonna decrease the amount of blood, one, that's flowing to your kidneys and two, the hydrostatic pressure is going to be less. It's going to want to move out of the capillary into the space even less so. Um, afferent arteriolar resistance, so afferent is coming in to the, to the space. Um, if you increase it, so you can see on the diagram here, if you increase the diameter of that, you can imagine that more blood is going to flow into the space. Therefore, you're going to increase your um, – oh, no, sorry. So if you decrease the resistance, you decrease how much it's contracting, so you have a greater radius, more blood can flow in, so you're going to have increased – glomerular capillary pressure and greater GFR. If you increase the resistance, you're actually like causing it to contract more. Um, blood finds it harder to move through. So you're going to have less blood entering your little space. You're gonna have decreased GFR and decreased renal blood flow. Does that make sense? Um, and then you have your efferent arteriolar resistance where that's the one that's going away. If you increase that, so if you increase the resistance, you're shortening the space, you're making it harder for the blood to flow out. Um, and so this is a bit of a, it has a bit of a biphasic effect. So if the constriction is moderate, the in, like the increase in um, resistance is moderate, you're actually going to increase the GFR, right? Uh, as long as your renal blood flow, so the blood flow to the rest of the kidneys isn't decreasing too much. But if you have quite severe constriction, so this is a bit of a generalization, but it's on the slides. Like if you increase the resistance too much, you actually um, increase the filtration fraction, which means more blood's going through, which means you actually get, like if you think about it, if more blood like um, fluid is leaving your capillaries and entering, entering your space, you're getting a concentration of your like albumin and proteins in the actual capillary, which is going to decrease the GFR because proteins want water to come towards them. So they're going to like not want to give the water up to the Bowman space. Does that make sense? Yep, so that's all there. Your net glomerular filtration pressure doesn't change across the length of the capillary. Quite big, it's highlighted, it's red. <laughs> Might come up, I don't know. Um, so your hydrostatic pressure, obviously, increase in hydrostatic pressure favours filtration. Plasma oncotic pressure and hydrostatic pressure, oh, and the hydrostatic pressure in Bowman's capsule, sorry, uh, oppose filtration. Yep. Should have had Bowman's capsule. All right, your turn. So absorption in the nephron happens, like, all throughout your nephron, and um, mainly in the proximal convoluted tubule, we have um, glucose and amino acids and most of your water as well. And um, everything's kind of listed out there. And what's important to note is your sodium um, absorptions as well. Because when you use diuretics, that's when they like take effect. And we'll go through that later on. But, and then in here, we have a little table on what's we absorbed as well. And sodium is passively um, like absorbed through the tubular surface of cells, but it's actively transported out of cells into your interstitium. And water follows um, any solute because you want to maintain your osmolarity. And then glucose and amino acids are co-transported with sodium normally, and they passively diffuse into your interstitium as well. 
Um, other important substances are chloride, which is usually um, follows sodium because uh, there's a negative charge in your tubule and you want to um, take that away and put like, sodium in, take it out. And um, it's otherwise like co-transported with sodium. Otherwise it passively diffuses by uh, like a paracellular pathway. And then you have uh, urea, which is passively reabsorbed. And then water leaves the tubules, uh, urea increases and then facilitates diffusion out of the, the cell. And uh, creatinine as well, which is not in there, but um, it's, it's, not, uh, it's filtered, but not reabsorbed. No, sorry. Uh, no, it's filtered, but not reabsorbed, sorry. No, it's not, it's secreted, secreted extra sorry, is secreted sorry. out by the muscles. Um, yeah, moving on. Yeah, so you have autoregulation which is what maintains your renal blood flow and um, GFR. So you need your blood pressure to be between 80 and 180 for that to be maintained. And um, you have like four different mechanisms. You have your sympathetic nervous system that can act, um, your hormonal uh, mechanisms, and your myogenic and juxtaglomerular mechanisms, as well as local factors that will get you. <coughs> so this is basically it in one slide, and it'll you can go through that. And it kind of says everything, but we'll go through it separately, like bit by bit. So you have myogenics first, which is when you in have an increase in blood pressure, which increases the stretch of your vessel wall. And um, this causes a contraction that happens. Um, yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, this causes contraction as well. And then that decreases your, the size of your vessel radius and then increases resistance. Yeah, if that kind of makes sense. And flow, um, flow is pressure divided by resistance. So if both of these increase, um, like see we have like flow, so you have your blood pressure, pressure here, resistance, they've both gone up proportionally, the flow is maintained and it doesn't get too high or too low. Um, and then we have your tubular glomerular mechanism, which is, sorry, up. Yes, which is your macular denser cells and your juxtaglomerular cells. This is when they act. So um, basically what they do is they um, maintain delivery of salt to the distal nephron. So your macular denser cells sense when there's a decrease in sodium delivery, and then they act in two different ways. So you have dilation of your afferent arterioles, so that would increase renal blood flow, and stimulation of your JG cells to um, secrete renin and then increase blood pressure again. And um, there are more JG cells than um, like macular denser cells. I don't know, fun fact, I guess, <laughs> you guys. Um, yeah. And it's just got that down there. But, and then you have your RAS system, your renin angiotensin aldosterone. And what happens here is you have um, some sort of acute activity. So dehydration, hemorrhage, sodium deficiency which causes a decrease in your, um, so acute hypovolemia, which is decreasing blood volume, and that decreases blood pressure. And then um, your kidneys start to act and releases renin and then con combines with angiotensin to make angiotensin one. Then that goes, that combines with ACE to make angiotensin two. And the angiotensin two has all these effects that I'll get into. Yeah, so angiotensin two, uh, this is, these are the basic functions. So it's a vasoconstrictor and increases uh, vascular resistance and BP, blood pressure, sorry. And um, it increases sodium and water reabsorption because they go together. And acts on the cortex as well, on your renal cortex to stimulate aldosterone, again, increasing blood pressure. And it stimulates vasopressin, which is ADH, antidiuretic hormone. Um, and that also increases blood pressure. It has like, <laughs> and it um, also stimulates your thirst centers in your brain too make you drink more water, increase blood pressure. And, um, but it can also cause cardiac and vascular hypertrophy, so you can pump a little harder mm. as well. Yeah, so you have um, aldosterone as well, which is part of that um, RAS system, and it's produced in the um, zona glomerulosa of, it, of the adrenal cortex, and uh, it stimulates the sodium, potassium, ATPase pump in the collecting ducts, and it increases, encourages sodium reabsorption and um, potassium excretion. So what happens is it's stimulated by angiotensin II as well as hyperkalemia. So you want to get rid of that, um, that um, potassium, hyponatremia. So you want to increase your amount of sodium or um, 
if you have high ACTH, which is an endocrine thing that you guys I don't think have done yet. And it's suppressed by your atrial natriuretic peptide. And you also have ADH, which is antidiuretic hormone. Sorry, there's no image there. <laughs> I was, uh, yeah. Oh. And it increases, so it's stimulated by plasma osmolarity. You should probably know that. That's, um, it's probably very important. And it increases your sodium um, reabsorption in your loop of Henle. And it acts to reabsorb water as well from the collecting duct. Yeah. So there's like, it stimulates the aquaporin insertion yeah. into the membranes. Something to know. And it dilates your, um, oh no, sorry. And it's um, inhibited by ANP again. And ANP, I don't have a slide on it, but I'll add it in later. But there is a slide. Oh, there is? Oh, okay, sorry. I do have a slide on it. <laughs> yeah, so this is basically how, um, oh, sorry, the one before was just basically how ADH acts. Yeah, so sure <laughs> sure. Sure. Yeah, this is how ADH acts. Yeah. So AMP, um, AMP dilates your afferent arterial and constricts your efferent arterial. Um, and it relaxes your me uh, mesangial cells, which can constrict, yeah, as you should mention before. Yeah. And it increases your GFR, inhibits renin secretion, and um, inhibits your RAS as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, no. Um, yeah. ANP is described, I, I don't know if you had the same lecture as us, but like the only good guy in like hemorrhage or anything that's putting a lot of stress on your heart, all your normal mechanisms are like going haywire and actually causing it to be kind of like a vicious cycle. Everything's getting worse, but your ANP and I think your BNP as well are like the only people, like not people, hormones trying to do the right thing and maintain home, like maintain homeostasis. Okay, so you have sympathetic control of your um, kidneys as well, which basically acts acutely. So when you have hemorrhage, or acute other types of acute hypovolemia, um, and that's um, that's activated by a decrease in sodium and water excretion, and it inhibits um, your sodium reabsorption in the proximal tubule in your thick ascending limb and loop of Henle, and um, it activates your a adrenergic sorry uh, receptors. Um, yeah, and it also stimulates your renin release and angiotensin II formation. Uh, and it also stimulates noradrenaline release from the brain and adrenaline from the adrenals to cause vasoconstriction as well as increase in your um, heart rate. And the ultimate effect is just increasing sodium reabsorption. And it, um, it, oh, sorry, it, uh, it acts in a graded response. So it starts off very um, mild by just increases, increasing the sensitivity of your JG cells to um, non-neural stimuli. And then it increases by um, start, um, going to the next step, which is increased renin, renin secretion. And then after that, it increases NA re, um, sodium reabsorption. And then, then it causes renal vasoconstriction. I'll add this later. <laughs> <laughs> renal vasoconstriction. And then finally, it reduces the GFR by causing um, mesangial cell contraction. Yep. Slide. Yeah, next slide. Right. Yeah, so questions. Question time. Question time. <laughs> um, how does ADH work? Anyone? Mary, how does ADH work? Okay, sorry, it's a long question. <laughs> <laughs> um, not quite, no. So it increases the concentration of um, sodium. It's not in the interstitium of the... Oh, this is a bit hard, actually. I don't know. <laughs> okay, so it's E. So it increases the permeability of your distal tubule. Because ADH... Oh, if you do that. It acts, where does that? It acts, oh, it doesn't say here. No, it okay, basically ADH, what yeah. it does is you've got these preformed like aquaporin channels yeah. and when it stimulates the receptors, these aquaporin channels like leave the cytoplasm, attach themselves to the membrane so more water can actually enter your blood, like the cells and then the bloodstream. Does that make sense? So, yeah. Right. yeah. Okay. 
And um, what compensate? Uh, what like compensation would you have during hemorrhage? So when you're like bleeding out. It's it's more than one. So. <laughs> yeah. So you have to justify why. Okay. <laughs> What's your main thing? Sorry? What's the main thing that would happen during hemorrhage? Like what system would activate? Like oh, yeah. Remember your four autoregulation mechanisms? <laughs> we, just, we just went through them. So. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, well, it's, it's E. No, yeah. it's not. So it's B, and, B and, uh, wait, sorry. You said, oh, it's oh, E. Is it? Yeah, yeah you, you changed the answer. No oh, no, I didn't change it. Okay. Oh, oh, did I? Oh, no. Keep going. It's E, but um, because your SNS acts when you're like, you're bleeding out, so you're fight fl and flight, you know, you need to stay alive, right? So, <laughs> um, so it decreases your GFR and your renal blood flow, and it causes peripheral vasoconstriction, retention of fluid, and increases your B, uh, blood pressure to maintain your organ perfusion so you don't, like, you know, die. Yep. So, yeah. And then later on, we also have RAS, which is C, as carbon. But later on is, like, five to ten minutes later. Immediately, you would get sympathetic act activation. Yeah, but you were right. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> kind of right. All right. Yeah, next one. Um, Sorry. Is this the same question? No, I, it's the same thing, just acute volume depletion. Oh, it's the same thing. Yeah. Damn it. Okay. Well, there's, this is kind of different. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's got volume depletion. Yeah, yeah, volume depletion. So, similar, but. If you're dehydrated. Yeah, it's more dehydration. So, think. Think of it in that think way. De think dehydration. dehydration. <laughs> um, the boy in the back. <laughs> The, the Jaffe in the back? <laughs> yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Aaron, answer the question. <laughs> Aaron's actually 16. Okay. Uh, well, you know, we'll go through it. Yeah. You know. um, so we have. <laughs> No, he's, <laughs> he's 16. He's 16, but he's in Anyway, um, so you'd have uh, your RAS and your um, tubular glomerular um, reflexes. Because you, um, when you have decreased water intake, you have increased like sodium concentration, increased sodium delivery, that would cause... Um, your macular denser senses well, it. Well. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Then um, RAS to just um, like increase your water retention and bring back your... Yeah. Increased osmolarity. Yeah. Oh, this is kind of a buzzwordy question, so no it. Yeah. You should probably know this one. No, like you should and all learn to know this. And every, everything else. Armshi, what do you think? Yeah, so buzzword ADH is like directly sensitive to plasma osmolarity, like the release of ADH. Oh, there's no answer there, but it's ADH. Oh, yeah, sorry, I just wrote it in the notes. Okay. <laughs> yes. This one? Yes. Wouldn't like um, depletion of the void of the is the more? Yeah, it would. Yeah, it would. Yeah. But like most, <laughs> like I guess the question should say, say <laughs> like most immediately, right? Yeah. Does that make sense? Or? So you have your, okay, if you are dehydrated, let's say, for this case, um, you have reduced water, so your everything else is in a higher concentration, right? So your juxta glomerular cells, your macular denser cells, sense that you know your your you've got too much sodium in your blood, and then they're like, you know, let's cause let's cause everything to like reabsorb water and 
decrease that osmolarity, kind of similar to the other one, as he mentioned. But, and then, um, oh, sorry, I wrote down my reasoning. Yeah, and you'd also have your RAS because um, that's just a secondary effect. Because your main one is probably your tubular glomerular reflex, and then after it is RAS. But it's because of the concentration of your sodium. Um, ADH here would be Think about it acutely. Yeah. For all your like for all the compartments in your body to have the same ionic composition, right? It's going to be like it's going to take a little bit more time. Whereas your kidneys receive 20 to 25 percent of your cardiac output, so they're probably going to be the first to kind of sense. Yeah, we'll we'll put post an explanation yeah. of. Any cases a bit later on. Yeah, we'll do that. Yeah. She'll do that. Yeah, I'll do that. Um, okay. okay. Oh, oh yeah. So sorry about this. We forgot to do this until. Shut, don't no. tell. Anyway. <laughs> um, so you have your osmoreceptors and your baroreceptors. Your osmoreceptors are very sensitive, and um, they increase sodium. Uh, increased salt will cause them to, um, to shrink, and they're located in your hypothalamus. Um, and this is this can happen with a one to two percent change in plasma osmolarity. And that will cause um, your thirst centers to be stimulated as well and for you to drink more water. So where those found again? Uh, sorry? Where are those found again? Uh, in your hypothalamus. Yeah. And they shrink in response to increased sodium. Yeah, sodium chloride. Uh, also, sorry, uh, answering Ahinza's question, your um let me just find it again. But your ADH has a sensitivity to plasma osmolarity, whereas it's less sensitive to blood volume, right? That's something the lecturer said. Probably should have added it in. <laughs> but it's more so ADH is very sensitive to plasma osmolarity, not as sensitive to blood volume. So if you've got blood volume changes, other mechanisms are going to be acting first. Yeah? Sweet. And um, so basically that's your pathway in there. So increased osmolarity, release of ADH and thirst and then increases your urine concentration and water intake. You'll do this more in yeah. endo as well. Oh, if you, have, yeah. you, have you guys started endo? No, no, no. no. so you'll start this then, yep. Is your brass system activated from that as well? Or is that like one to 2% not enough to increase the sodium in your ADH activated or? Wait, what was your? With the one to 2% increase in like the plasma polarity, which you're saying is very sensitive and that will activate your ADH. Yep. Is your RAS activated as well with that osmolarity increase? Eventually. Not so that's more down the line. Not you, I, don't, I don't think so immediately. Mm. Yeah, because yeah, RAS is more global. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that would take a bit more. Your baroreceptors, important to know where they are. Yeah. So your aortic arch and your carotid sinus. They had that question. Yeah, well, the, you'll be asked this yeah. like throughout yeah. medical school, so. We, we don't know. Yeah, so your decreased blood volume is what causes your baroreceptors to like start firing. And um, you have um, bar uh, baroreceptors in your aorta and carotids, and stretch receptors in your atrial and um, pulmonary arteries. And um, these are less sensitive than your osmoreceptors, and a 10 to 15% 10 change is required to stimulate first. Okay, cool. Yeah, next. And next, yeah. Your inflammation. You just need to kind of know where where the urine goes. So it starts in your collecting tubules, papillary ducts, minor ca uh, calyx, major calyx, renal pelvis, ureter, and then we've gone through the rest yeah. of this. And then okay, so you, uh, your urine concentration happens in your thick ascending loop panel, and um, your water and okay, so you have three different st steps. So you have your glomerular filtration. So water and small solutes are forced through um, through your capillaries into the capsule and then through the capsule into the tubule and then after there's like there was an image of oh, i'll have that image too <laughs> your tubular reabsorption happens uh that's your second step so water glucose amino acids are transported out of your tu um, tubule cells into your capillaries then um your tubular secretion happens so um yeah <laughs> um your hydrogen ions um your potassium your creatinine and other drugs are removed uh, from your um, peritubial blood into uh, and is secreted into your filtrate and then excreted yeah. after that. All right, so yeah. we'll do the renal handling of bicarbonate. Did Chris Wright give you this lecture? Yep, so he's super good <laughs> at lecturing. <laughs> um, so this is like year 12 chem, your bicarbonate homeostasis. So you've got water, carbon dioxide forming. 
bicarbonate. Like you've got the equation up there. So your kidneys need to keep the plasma, uh, the circulating plasma bicarbonate levels pretty constant. So they filter it at the glomerulus, <laughs> reabsorb it in the proximal convoluted tubule, and then they also regenerate it. So they make more if you need it. Yep. So in your proximal convoluted tubule, you've got it being reabsorbed. Yeah. Second. Yep. So you've got like, all these transporters, the diagram is good, but we'll go through it in a bit more detail. So basically your hydrogen ions combine with your bicarbonate in your tubular lumen, so here, um, and there like the reaction is catalyzed by carbonic anhydrase, yep, um, which forms carbon dioxide and water. So in that way, your carbon dioxide then can freely permeate into your proximal, proximal tubular cells and then it goes through the same thing again, right? So it combines with water, carbonic anhydrase, and it breaks up into uh, hydrogen and bicarbonate again. Um, your bicarbonate is reabsorbed. So that's how you're reabsorbing your bicarbonate. But the actual hydrogen ion, there's no net loss. So as soon as you use it, um, catalyze it in the actual tubular cell, it gets pumped back out again, and you pretty much keep using the same amount of hydrogen ions. Um, just reabsor to reabsorb the bicarbonate that's actually been filtered out by your glomerulus into the tubules. Does that make sense? Cool. Um, and then this is, I find it quite low yield. So your proximal convoluted tubule can also regenerate uh, bicarbonate. And it's basically through the breakdown of alpha ketoglutarate, which breaks it down into ammonium and bicarbonate, right? It's broken down, you've reabsorbed the bicarbonate and you excrete the ammonium. I think that's the main gist to get from proximal convoluted tubule regeneration. Um, and then your distal convoluted tubule. So if you remember, that's where all the fine tuning happens. You get secretion of bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. Um, it's called like titratable acidity because you can change how fast these cells work or I mean your body can. So you've got principal cells, um, intercalated cells, which are alpha or beta bit of an overview. So your principal cells are aldosterone responsive, they reabsorb sodium and water, and they secrete potassium. Um, and the number of NAK pumps depends on how much, like depends on aldosterone responsiveness. Yep. Again, the same diagram. No, I went back. <laughs> yeah, okay, this also, I think it's like, I don't remember being tested on this, but important to just know that alpha secrete acid, so they get rid of acid. Um, so that you will urinate it out. Um, they're both uh, aldosterone responsive and beta secrete base. So what could alpha intercalated cells be useful in? What physiological state would you need to get rid of acid in? Yes, Ella, DKA. Yeah, acidosis. So any type of metabolic acidosis and vice versa. Um, any type of metabolic alkalosis. Yep, <laughs> I don't know why this is Um No, these factors controlling bicarbonate reabsorption. So how much bicarbonate is actually in your tubular lumen, how fast like the substances are moving through the tubular lumen, how much arterial carbon dioxide you have and angiotensin II as well. I'm not sure. All right, question time. <laughs> With regards to bicarbonate control, which of the following is false? Um, Rhea, you can answer. So. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Do you know why? Can you explain your answer, Rhea? Yep. So if you've got blood pH is higher than usual, you're going to be using your beta intercalated cells. 
to get rid of the bicarbonate, which is making your blood alkalotic. <laughs> All right, acid-base balance. Um, so your neutral pH is different to your normal pH, and that's just because of the dissociation. I'm sure Chris Wright would have just gone on and on about that. But basically, acidosis is less than 7.35. Alkalosis is anything more than 7.45, right? Um, you have two types of acid production. So you can have volatile, and volatile just means you can exhale it. Um, and then if you remember from RESP, your partial pressure, pressure of carbon dioxide is proportional to one on minute ventilation. So if you're breathing more, that fraction is going to get bigger, which means you're going to be blowing off more CO2, thus its concentration in your body is going to be lower, yes? Um, and then you've got fixed and non-volatile acids, which is basically stuff you can't breathe off. So sulfuric acid, phosphoric acid, um, stuff basically from just metabolism, all right? Um, buffering of hydrogen ions, any substance that binds to it is a buffer. They minimize the pH change, they don't actually prevent it. So if you've got a lot of stuff going on, going wrong, um, this isn't going to help that much, all right? So your lungs, if you've got metabolic acidosis or respiratory, like any acidotic state, you're going to try and breathe quite rapidly um, to repeat, like to get rid of the CO2. Your kidneys, the bicarbonate mechanisms there actually take a bit longer to not like kick in and have an effect, but basically you excrete your hydrogen ions and reabsorb more bicarbonate. Yep. All right. Now reading an ABG. There will be a couple of questions. Oh. There will be questions on this in the in the future. Uh, arterial blood gas. Yep. So when you take an ABG, you're looking for basically trying to see levels of like carbon dioxide and bicarbonate in the blood. See if the patient's like metabolically alkalotic, acidotic, respiratory. Yep. Um, so these are the normal values, which I thought I just put up for reference. But there's like a method that you need to do. Now, Chris Wright does it. He's like, is this acidosis or alkalosis? So look at the value. If it's above 7.45, it's going to be in unison. That's going to be yeah. <laughs> alkalotic. Yeah. If it's below uh, 7.3, 3, 3, 6, yeah, it's going to be acidosis. Um, and then you have to think about whether it's respiratory or metabolic and if there's compensation, right? So in respiratory acidosis, what is going to be your primary change? Like in terms of CO2 or HCO3, are they going to go up, down? And what's your body going to do to respond to that? Um, you in the striped shirt behind Armshi. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. And what's your body going to do to compensate? Yep. Sure. Yep. <laughs> Think about it in more like CO2 and HCO3. Is your, is your bicarbonate going to go up or down to try and balance out your increase in carbon? Yeah. So your carbon dioxide and your bicarbonate both go up. Does that make sense why that happens? Yep. How about in respiratory alkalosis? Um, Ying Tong. <laughs> Pre-clean rep. You should know. Um, respiratory alkalosis. Yep. Um, just the opposite. Yep. Mm, cool. You want to say it? <laughs> 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 okay. No, okay. okay. So your CO2 goes down. And so you're getting quite basic, right? Your blood's getting base. <laughs> um, so you, your body is going to want to try and re reduce the base in your system and get rid of the extra base. Uh, metabolic acidosis, what's the primary change there? Yes, you, is that a hand up? I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> Would it be carbon dioxide or bicarbonate? That's metabolic. Yeah, that's metabolic. If CO2 is respiratory. Yeah. 
Is it going to go up or down? Yeah. Yeah. Wait. Say that again. Okay. <laughs> You're going to go down. And what are you going to try and do as compensation? You want more if you if you've got acidosis. You want less acid in your blood. So. Yep, so you're going to breathe it out. You're going to try and decrease the acid. So, yeah, decrease CO2. Um, metabolic alkalosis. Wait. Yeah. yeah. Wait, that's not right. No, decrease. Is this right? This isn't right. I copied it. All right. If you have metabolic acidosis, what's good for No, it would go. No, yes, yeah. Oh, yeah if you have metabolic yeah, acidosis, you want to get rid of acid any way you can. Yep. Um, metabolic alkalosis. Michaela. <laughs> yep. Good. -o. Is anyone having any problems understanding that? Nope. Sweet. You can, like, if you don't want to say that right now, email us. Um, so respiratory acidosis, you know, the Boston rules. You basically, who you said no? Not know your boss knows. <laughs> okay. Did, oh, okay. Well, basically, so the, the rules for compensation are if you've got respiratory acidosis acutely, you're going to have, for every 10, increase in 10 you have for CO2, you're going to have an increase of one. So it's like a one to 10. If it's chronic, so over a long time, you're going to have a four to 10 ratio. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Not yeah. saying anything. <laughs> All right. Metabolic acidosis. So your immediate um, the young judge went up the back before said increasing respiratory ventilation. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so that's correct. And later, this is like the alkalosis ones aren't as important to know, but your later predicted PCO2, if you think there's compensation, your PCO2, you calculate it. So if your bicarb has gone down 1.5 times that plus eight should be what your PCO2 is if your body is compensating properly. Yep. All right. This is the six rules of thumb. It's not going to make any sense to you because you haven't like got the lecture, but basically that's it. Like, does this make sense to everyone? So it's basically trying to say if your body is compensating or not compensating for the, your primary change. Yeah. yeah. So you can so you basically like you might get like a value of yeah. like a set of values like this is the pco2 this is the like bicarbonate is this metabolic respiratory acidosis and if so if it's either one of them is it compensated or uncompensated and using the values you've got it's just simple maths putting it into an equation or like remembering the equation at least um to see yes does that mean the body responds better in body Clotting conditions. Clotting conditions? Sorry. Like, because the ratios for... Yep. The math speaks for itself. Oh, chronic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure. It's just the rule. Yeah, yeah. just the rule. So just follow that. Yeah, but if you have a chronic problem, your body would adapt, adapt to that better than if it's acute. Uh, yeah. Needs more yeah. Yeah. Yep. yep. Makes sense. Yep. Um, Henderson Hasselbalch equation has. I don't know if Chris Wright's done that with you. He does like this equation. Again, you're going to be given a set of values. Pro most probably be given the equation as well. Just need to plug some numbers in. Cool. All right. Urinary acid excretion. So there's three ways you can measure. Um, how much acid you're excreting, so you get urine pH, which will tell you the free H+. plus. Your titratable acidity is actually going to tell you how much of you've excreted that's been buffered. So it's been, like, put onto another, like, a elect no, not electronic acceptor, electron removal or something, I don't know. Um, basically where it's been buffered, so any buffered substances. And then you've got your urinary am uh, ammonia slash ammonium. Yep. This is pretty like low yield. I don't think you're going to be asked this, but yep. Anion gap. Have you done this? Yep. Okay. So your anion gap is basically your sodium minus your um, chloride and your bicarbonate. So it's just minus chloride minus bicarbonate. Um, 
yep, just the other, like whatever's left, the gap is other, like not unknown, but like collective um, cations and no, anions, sorry. All right, so an elevated gap, this is how to remember, like if you've got uh, like an acidosis with an elevated gap, it's going to be mud piles. So important ones, important ones to know are uremia, diabetic ketoacidosis, lactic acidosis and salicylates, right? Um, Non-elevated is heart up, just no acetazolamide and diarrhea. Someone have a question? Acetazolamide is a potassium sparing. Right. Yep, we'll get to farm. All right, buzzwords. Deep rapid breathing is probably if you're breathing quite fast. Compensation for metabolic acidosis or respiratory alkalosis. Like you can go through this again. Okay, micturition, Parkington, have you had this one? No, okay. It's when she gave it to us, it was kind of all over the place. So I've tried to like make it like simpler. So basically you've got your bladder and it's got sensory stretch receptors which travel from the bladder to the spinal cord via the pelvic nerve and then back from the spinal cord to the bladder via parasympathetic nerves, right? You've also got sphincters, so your internal one, as with most things, your internal one is smooth muscle, it's involuntary. You can't like control, uh, like you can, but you're not, you can't choose whether it's open or not. And then your external is your striated skeletal and it's voluntary. Um, so in a partially filled bladder, right? You've got spontaneous, so as it's filling, it's going to activate the sensory stretch receptors, which will go up to the spinal cord and then back from the spinal cord to the bladder and cause it to like contract, right? These spontane these um, contractions are spontaneous and they resolve themselves. So you'll get like, um, you'll get it contracting and then it'll relax. You'll get it contracting again and then it'll relax. Um, and if it's like a successful micturition reflex is one that results in you going to the bathroom. Um, and if like there's one that's unsuccessful, basically like you'll be like, oh, I really need to go. But if you like kind of, hold it back, um, it'll go away for a couple of minutes and then come back and your bladder, bladder will start contracting again. Uh, your bladder has special type of epithelium called urethelium, which is waterproof. Just cool fact. <laughs> um, so if you, the more your bladder feels, the frequent and stronger your contractions get. And then a very powerful micturition reflex. So if you're getting a lot of contractions, send a signal via the pudendal nerve to external um, urethral sphincter and make it contract so that you're not actually like wetting yourself. Yep. So there's a, like, just learn this kind of. So it's a summary. Okay. Anyone have any questions about this? Oh. You can actually give Botox, I think Parkinson will say, to like people who are incontinent to try and help them maintain the integrity of their sphincters. Yep. Did you say that? Yep. Types of incontinence. This is the kind of stuff you ask in your renal history. Stress incontinence is if they're like running and a little bit of pee comes out. Urge is like they think about it. They might like think about it or they might get stressed in some other way. And the moment they think, oh, I need to pee, they will wet themselves. Like they don't have the time to get to the bathroom and go to the bathroom. Um, flaccid bladder is like a spinal cord injury below T12. And. Um, oh, I don't have it there. Just spinal, like spinal cord injury. Your flat, your bladder doesn't like when it fills up. You don't get the stretch receptors, like see, like sensing that it's filling up. You don't there, therefore don't get contraction. Therefore, you don't know when you need to go to the bathroom. So water just like keeps coming in, filling in the bladder, and eventually it will go up the ureters and cause hydronephrosis. So backflow into the kidney. Oh yeah, it's written there. Okay, so far. Um, main, okay, so we're focusing on absorption again. And you have diuretics. So that increases naturesis, so excretion of sodium, and um, <laughs> causes secondary diuresis, which is excretion of water. And um, water follows sodium because um, in order to maintain tonicity and osmolarity. And so this is basically a like an overview of all the types of diuretics you have. And you can go through that if you want. And it's just on one page. But we have... Okay, this is another image that we can put that. So we have our carbonic anhydrase inhibitors acting in your proximal convoluted tubule. Uh, then your loop diuretics acting in your loop of Henle, mostly in the thick ascending limb. 
and then your thiazides acting in your distal um, convoluted tubule, and then your potassium sparing, which is acting in your the proximal, like the distal part of your collecting. Yeah. Oh, in the collecting cup. Sorry. Oh, the distal. Yeah, a bit of both. So your um, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. Uh, that's acetazolamide. Sorry, mm -hmm. that's not a potassium sparing um, diuretic. And um, what it does is it inhibits carbonic anhydrase um, in the proximal collecting tubule, and it break, uh, prevents the breakdown of bicarbonate and the reabsorption of sodium in water. So you're oh sorry yeah. So oh I didn't put that. <laughs> um, so basically, if you remember back to like renal handling of bicarbonate, your your bicarbonate that you like uh, reabsorb is imported with your um, sodium back into your blood. Uh, if you don't have enough bicarbonate to be simported back with the sodium because it does need, like, you know, when you need all three to latch on so another one can go through, if that doesn't happen, you're not going to get sodium reabsorption to the full extent that it usually occurs. So it's used in glaucoma to reduce blood pressure there in your eyes and um, you're in metabolic acidosis and acute mountain sickness. So in terms of side effects, what you get is hyper, hyper, sorry, yeah. hyperglock. Sorry, I can't. Uh, bicarbonate urea, uh, hypokalemia, hyperchloremia, so your um, uh, chloride, and uh, you can get paresthesia and also um, renal stones, I think. Nephrolithiasis, yeah. This is a fancy term for renal stones. Um, and yeah, so moving on, sorry. And you have your loop diuretics which are your most potent, they're the best diuretics that you, you can use, and it causes 25% of um, your sodium excretion. This is what everyone on the wards like has for any, like most people have this. And um, it acts in your thick ascending loop of Henle. And it, it inhibits your sodium, uh, your sodium uh, potassium chloride uh, AT, uh, like carrier in the luminal membrane. Yep. Buzzword. Yeah. <laughs> no, which which exact channel it acts on. Yeah, so remember that. And it increases the delivery of potassium to your distal nephron. Yeah. And it causes um so your side effects that you oh your indications are um congestive heart failure, uh hypercalcemia because it causes um your calcium to reduce, acute kin uh, kidney injury and hypertension. Sorry, H2. Yeah, you apparently. Sorry, Red. Anyway. Um uh, you next use thiazides, which act also in your ascending loop of Henle. Sorry. What's that one? Thick ascending. Oh, just in your, yeah, in your thick ascending loop of Henle. And they, they are not as strong, and you usually give them with uh, another diuretic. And they increase delivery of sodium to your um, collecting ducts, causing increased cellular uptake of luminal sodium by your epithelial sodium channels. Sorry, that's a bit of a mouthful. Um, and uh, this causes basolateral, like, sodium-potassium exchange. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so what you use it for is, again, um, congestive heart failure, hypertension. And, you, oh, you use it in nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. You, you'd think you wouldn't give it because you're already um, urinating a lot, but you get, uh, it has some sort of paradoxical effect. And you also give it in renal stones, or nephrolithiasis. Yeah, and uh, your potassium sparing diuretics. Um, so your uses for that. Are, oh, so it works in your collecting tubule. I know. Put that in there. Oh. I know. <laughs> um, uh, and so it has a weak diuretic effect, and it blocks the effect of aldosterone, and that's how it reduces your blood pressure. Um, so what happens is uh, it stops sodium from being recycled into the blood and causes um, potassium to be retained. Yeah. And... Um, the main side effect is just hyperkalemia, and you give it with another diuretic to prevent that from happening. You give sponolactone, so that's a potassium sparing diuretic, usually with frizamide if there is hypokalemia, because this yeah. would cause you to get all that sodium back. Yeah. Yep. And your osmetic um, diuretics are uh, mannitol, which works over the entire your entire nephron, and it causes um, it's it's filtered but not reabsorbed. And it pulls water with it as it goes through. And it has a quick half-life use in yep. acute volume overload. Yeah, and then you have your ACE inhibitors. So this prevents your conversion from your angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Uh, what it does is, sorry. 
<laughs> so those are your prills, like perinder pril, like all your other prills, yep. just ends in pril. Um, and it uh, decreases angiotensin II and decreases GFR and prevents the constriction of your efferent arterial and increases uh, renin due to the loss of your like feedback system. Um, and, oh, sorry. No, no. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, and ACE breaks down bradykinin, as you can see here. And bradykinin um, causes uh, like a cough as a side effect. So um, that's why you would give people like another drug that will get up yep. to you. Some people get really badly affected by ACE inhibitors and they get a really bad dry cough. Buzzword for ACE inhibitors is dry cough. Yeah. And yep. you'd give it in high, um, hypertension, heart failure, and it's supposed to reduce mortality. I don't know if that's relevant for second year, but yeah. it comes like, up a lot. Uh, the, your pharmacology lecture would have talked about ACE, uh, like in either cardio or renal. Mm -hmm. ACE inhibitors, potassium sparing diuretics, particularly spironolactone, are really good for remodeling when you've had a heart attack. Yes. Yep. So it. just really good drugs. We like to put everyone on them. Not we. We. Not we. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what you get is, oh, you can also use it in proteinuria and diabetic nephropathies. And your adverse effects are cough, which is the main one, um, and your edema as well. And it can be um, teratogenic in some yeah. cases. Um, does anyone, everyone understand like it preferentially acts on the efferent arterial bit? Okay, so your angiotensin receptor blockers um, are just, there's two types of receptors though that you have. So this only blocks one type, one of the receptors. And this is basically just given to patients who can't tolerate the ACE inhibitor due to the dry cough. Um, so it's, uh, I used to think that it was like better because you didn't get a cough, but it doesn't act as globally. So it doesn't reduce your um, blood pressure as much. Yeah. And um, digoxin. Uh, Sorry? I'll triple that. I don't know. So, yep. yeah. So it just blocks your um, sodium, potassium, ATPase pump in your cardiac cells. And um, it's also processed renally. That's basically why it's in here. It's, it's pretty, like, it has a lot of side effects. We don't, yeah. not we. we don't, uh, people don't people like to give it. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, unless, yeah special circumstances. Uh, we'll quickly skim through PATH. I realize it's getting to yeah. five o'clock. Everyone wants to go home. PATH is your acute renal failure and chronic renal failure lectures. Have you had those? Yep. Um, if they were the same as ours, the guy would have just gone through a lot of stuff really quickly, but there are questions that can come from those two lectures. Um, so you've got this, as we said before, you need about 50 to 60% of your serum creatinine, uh, like to lose 50 to 60% of your renal function for serum creatinine to skyrocket up. Yep. Um, acute renal failure is basically over a short period of time. Yep, that's about it. Complications of acute renal failure, salt and water retention, hyperkalemia, which does anyone know what a side effect, not side effect, but like a complication of having too much potassium can be? Yes. Uh, it can cause metabolic acidosis, uremia, because you're not getting rid of the hydrogen ions and wastes, a catabolic stage state, and it can also lead to end-stage renal failure. Causes, basically pre-renal, intra-renal, and post-renal. Pre-renal is mo mostly like there's not enough blood getting to your kidneys. Intra-renal is usually something toxic that's destroyed your renal par uh, parenchyma. Post-renal is usually something obstructing like the fluid leaving the bladder. Um, yeah, it's in red, like that's can come up on the exam. This is important. If someone comes in um, and they have an acute kidney injury, you're not going to expect them to have small kidneys. Small kidneys comes as a result of chronic renal failure. Also anemia, renal bone disease and peripheral neuropathy are processes that take a long period of time to occur. So someone with an acute kidney injury or acute renal failure is not going to have these. All right, triple whammy. Don't give someone NSAIDs, ACE inhibitor and diuretics because that is going to shut down their kidney. Yep. Any questions about that? No. Nope. Does everyone kind of get why? It's All these things are depleting the volume. Yep. Okay, chronic renal failure. So you've got all the normal functions of your kidney. If these were compromised long term, obviously the things the kidney does, think about what would happen if they didn't occur. So you're going to get heart failure, metabolic acidosis, toxicity, anemia, and bone disease. The main causes of chronic kidney disease, like a big one, is hypertension. And 
it's a like if anyone if anyone has chronic kidney disease you usually put them on antihypertensive medication because that is really really bad for the kidneys but you can also get diabetic nephropathy and glomerulonephritis uh which of these is not a short term actually we'll skip the question yeah you guys clinical skills good. and conditions everyone wants to go home yeah so. um this is probably a good question to do anyone The kid that dabbed up the back just then, would you like to answer the question? Sorry? Yes, cystitis. What would you use the first line antibiotic to treat it? Buzzword. Yeah, the buzzword. Remember this one. Trimethoprim. Oh, okay. Trimethoprim is the to a person who's healthy, so like they're not like they're not in a different physiological state like pregnancy or they don't have like malignancy and they've got a normal urinary tract so no deformities there, you give them trimethoprim for about three to five days, all right? Cystitis is a lower urinary tract infection. It's highlighted in red like it's if you get more than 10 to the five organisms per mil and it's midstream, so you have to get a midstream urine sample. It's mostly E. coli. Um, e. coli is pink and rod-like. You might be asked to identify it on a histology like slide. Uh, it's mostly women who are sexually active of reproductive age with a normal urinary tract, all right? Not like a weird urinary tract, a deformed one. <laughs> Treatment is tripethoprim, three days, twice a day. Uh, urinary tract infections, again, mostly E. coli, but you can, people who have like urinary tract abnormalities, females, because their urethra is shorter, therefore bacteria is going to take not as long to get up it as opposed to a male's urethra. Um, stasis, so if you're not emptying your bladder, it kind of collects. Um, foreign bodies and if you're immunosuppressed, you're more likely to get bacterial infections anyway. Clinical features, you like go more often, you want to like, you need to go again, not sure you're getting up at night to go to the bathroom, painful peeing, you can get blood and it smells pretty foul. Um, pyelonephritis, so as opposed to having a lower urinary tract infection, you'd expect this if they've got back pain, right? because that's going to indicate it's higher up and if they've got systemic symptoms because it's actually infiltrated one of the organs. Yep. Your analysis, you're going to look for leukocytes and nitrites. Does anyone know what nitrites would indicate? Yep, what kind? Yes, gram negative because nitrites are a byproduct of breakdown or something. Yeah. They convert nitrates to nitrites. Um, yep, uh, prophylaxis. Like really, just take a lot of fluid, going to the bathroom after sex. <laughs> <laughs> Cranberry juice, it stops bacteria adhering to the bladder wall and going to the bathroom regularly. All right. Yep. Why is that? Okay. Um, your analysis, this is just like go through this in your own time because everything's pretty much there. If you see these things in your urinalysis, like, you can pretty much get a clear indication. This is one of a really easy bedside test you could do. Um, yep. Nutcracker syndrome, we talked about it before, when your left renal get vein gets compressed by the SMA, causes backflow, and um, you kind of get males coming in with varicocele, so like big blue testes and blood in the urine as well. All right, glomerulonephritis, like... Pretty, like, I, we didn't get any questions on it. Know it if you want to. Like, this, this is a pretty good table that summarises it. Um, and there's buzzwords as well. Nephrotic, this is important. Nephrotic, like, fro protein. So you're losing protein. It's more than 3.5 grams a day, right? Um, and then nephritic sounds more inflammatory, so it's more hematuria, so blood. And red blood cell casts is a buzzword for this. Which of the following is not associated with nephrotic syndrome? Just quick. Minot. Um. No clue. I'm guessing C. C? Okay, so if you're losing protein, albumin is a protein, so you are going to have hypoalbuminemia. It's actually hyponatremia. You get hyponatremia, and even then, you only get it in severe states of um, nephrotic syndrome. Yep. All right. This guy comes in. He's got red urine. He thinks he's got cancer. He's actually just taking a drug. 
for trunking. Connor Heaney. <laughs> Yeah. Ruth Amperson, yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, thank you. No, you've uh, yeah, answers. you've got the answers, oh. as if you guys aren't answering. Yeah. Um, bit of a summary table, R for red. All right, uh, polycystic kidney disease causes berry aneurysms. You'll cover it more in neuro, but basically things that can cause subarachnoid hemorrhages. Kidney stones, it's buzzword, loin to groin pain, because as... The um, like urine is traveling down the ureters, it's encountering obstruction, and it's like you know, vermiculating, and you're getting pain that goes from your loin to your groin. <laughs> Remember the ureteric constrictions, okay. that's it. Yeah, thank you.